God. Yes, praise the Lord. Lord Jesus is all. How many of you really believe that, that Jesus is all we need in life? You, you really believe that? If you really believe that, say it with me. Say, Jesus is all I need. Uh, Jesus is all I need. And, and his grace is sufficient for everything in my life. Yeah, that Jesus provides by his grace. And, and we've been looking at grace for about the last a couple of months. Uh, of course, we had Christmas in, in the middle of it. But I had a couple of messages before Christmas, and then we've had all the messages in, in, in January have been about the grace of God, because the grace of God is the power of God to affect our life. And I'm presenting to you basically the premise that without the grace of God, nothing in our life happens. Now, we can try to make it happen by our determination, by our willpower, you know, by self-discipline, and we can... We can struggle against everything that, that tries to drag us down and pull us down, and we can fight our flesh, and self-discipline is a good thing. It's an absolutely necessary thing and an important thing in our life, but that it's not powerful enough to really affect the deep things that we, that we really need controlled and, and affected in our life, the big, let's say the big things in life. And those of you that have the outline, you, you see kind of how I, I started, started it off. Let, let, me just, let me just read this, this to you and save us just a little bit of time because I'll start elaborating on some stuff. But let me, just, let me just read this. We all have something in life that we would like to change. Is that true? How many of you have something in life? Now, I'm not going to ask you what it is, so don't be afraid to lift your hand. How many of you have something in, in your life that you would like to change? about yourself and about the way you practice things. Okay, good. See, if you look around, I mean, almost everybody in here has something in life that you want to change. Well, it could be something that we would like to stop doing, such as overeating or drinking alcohol excessively or constantly being late or worrying or those kind of things. Or it could be something that we would like to begin doing more consistently, like exercising or reading our Bible or practicing more patience. Uh, according to Nielsen Analytics, now listen to this, uh, this is the end of January, so many of you, did any of you, how many of you made a resolution at the start of the year? You said, all right, this year I want to do this. Uh, did you do that? Did anybody, does anybody kind of do that? Well, if you do, Nielsen Analytics has kind of made studies of these kind of things, and, and they tell us that uh, uh, when we make, a, make these resolutions about these big areas of our life, that only 64% of New Year's resolutions survive past the first month. So only 64% of the people that made these resolutions right now, this is the last Sunday in January, would actually be still stuck to that resolution. And that um, only 46% continue past the first six months. So now you're down to about half of the people that made resolutions being able to stick with that resolution for six months. And then only 12% succeed in accomplishing the resolution. So that's you know basically one out of 10 do. So, the, so the, actually the statistics are very low, right? So the bad news is that most of us find it very difficult to change the big things in our life. And if asked would conclude that the reason most people don't succeed is linked to commitment and willpower. And if that's what you feel like it, it is to accomplish these big changes in our life, willpower, commitment, self-determination, if that's what you're thinking that you need more of, you say, well, I'm just not committed enough or I, my willpower's not strong enough. Uh, if you feel like that's what it takes to change your life, then you're going to be wrong because the Bible teaches us a very simple lesson. It really is, and it's so simple that we we miss it. Uh, I know in our our heart, and when when you see what we do, look at in the Scripture today, it'll be like, really? I mean, it could really be that simple. It it doesn't take a tremendous willpower. It's not not this gigantic commitment that I'm just not committed enough or I don't have enough willpower and I don't have enough strength to stick to it. You mean it, change in my life is really not about that kind of commitment to the Lord? No, it's not because the statistics say to us that the big areas of our life really can't be changed by willpower and commitment because if they could, there wouldn't be so much failure in these resolutions of life. 
There wouldn't be just one out of 10 people that could actually accomplish some big thing in life that they want to change. So how, how, do you, how do you change? If you feel in your heart that God has led you to change and you are dissatisfied with something about your life, how do you change? Well, you change by understanding three things in your life. There are three big understandings that we need to have about how change happens in our life, and, and then our lives can, can be changed. We can affect change in our life. And it really is this simple, and it really is this, this easy as we lay these, and we, we, according to the Scripture, uh, we understand these principles, and then we place them before the Lord. Now, the first principle, the first understanding that we have to have in order for things to change in our life is that we need to understand, well, let me just put it up here. Uh, we need to understand the corrupt and incorrigible nature of your flesh. The word incorrigible, or incorrigible means that it, that it can't be changed. If someone is incorrigible, you know, you've heard somebody say, well, he's incorrigible. Well, what they're saying is that uh, there's no way to change them, that you, can't, that, that you can't do anything that's going to change them in life. You can't help them. So we need to understand that part of our life that is in our life and will be with us in all of our life until we die or until Jesus returns is that we all have flesh, what the Bible calls flesh. And by flesh, it means a nature that is in us that cannot be changed, that it is a fallen flesh, that it, is, uh, that it is a nature that is controlled by a law of sin and death, and it is that I'm going to, ha I'm going to have to fight against this nature because this nature is going to want to sabotage my life and control my life as long as I'm on this earth, and the only time this will ever be changed in me is when Jesus takes me to heaven and, and, and changes me and gives me a brand new life and a brand new body and a brand new mind with the Lord. Now, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7, we have the Apostle Paul who wrote 13, maybe 14 books of the New Testament, tremendous man of God, apart from Jesus Christ himself, probably the most brilliant theologian that has ever lived on this earth. And so he's, he brilliantly knows the word of God and the law of God and the truth of God. I mean, you, you couldn't have a better understanding of, of how the nature of God is than the apostle Paul has. And on top of that, he's a Pharisee. Now, many of you might not know much about Pharisees, but this is really all you might need to know in connection with this, is that the Pharisees were very disciplined, were a very disciplined sect of, Jew, of Jewish leaders. This means that they knew the law backwards and forwards. They could quote ver verses. They could quote scriptures. They, they possibly knew the entire Old Testament law by memory, and they could quote any part of it that you asked them. And they were very disciplined in life. They had 653 rules concerning the Sabbath day alone. So they, they practiced a, a very legalistic kind of life. So the Apostle Paul, before he came to the Lord, he was a Pharisee. And he said, not only was I a Pharisee, but I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. In other words, I was like a super Pharisee. Uh, I would even, uh, not only would I judge people who aren't Pharisees, I'd judge people that were Pharisees because they, they couldn't possibly be as disciplined as I am. Well, I want you to understand in Romans chapter 7, this is who's talking to us. This Pharisee of Pharisee, this, this very disciplined person who theologically was brilliant and gave us 13 or 14 of the 27 books that are in the New Testament. And here's what he's saying in chapter 7 of Romans. I want you to just keep that in mind, and I'm going to read this out of the Message Bible, and, and, and because it's just, you know, it just says it in a good way. Now look, all right, here it goes. Paul says, I can anticipate the response that is coming. I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. Isn't this also your experience? Yes, I'm full of myself. After all, I've spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things that I absolutely despise. Is anybody, is anybody seeing themselves? 
Yeah, so if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. But I need something more for if I know the law but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something's gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel. <laughs> Look at it. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? Yeah, so how many of you identify with that? I know that now this is the Apostle Paul just being honest with us about how his life is and what happens in, in all of our lives. And, here, and, he's, and he's saying to us, I, I want you to know that no matter how brilliant you may be or how disciplined you may be in, you, in the way you live your life, you're going to struggle with change. And, and, and the King James says, says it this way, basically, that, that we have within us flesh, and that flesh wars against us every time we try to do good. When we try to do good, our flesh rises up, our old nature, our sin nature, the nature that is within us that will be the, 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 the sin nature within us that we're going to battle against until Jesus comes or we go home to be with him. And he, let, let, matter of fact, let me just read it. This is Romans 7, last two or three verses, same verses. This is just in the, in the King James Version. Look at it, what it says. Paul says, I find in a law. Well, what is that, Paul? What is that law, Paul? Well, the law is that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. In other words, I, Paul says, I have in me a law that's operating. Everybody say the law of sin and death. That's the law. The Paul says, I have a, the one who wants to do good, the one who wants to please God. Let me tell you, I have within me a law, and that law is that the flesh is alive and will always battle against the spirit to sabotage any great thing that God wants to do in life. So I have a law within me. Everybody say, laws don't change. Laws don't change. Natural laws don't change, right? I mean, even natural. With it, we're talking about a spiritual law here, but natural laws don't change. Gravity as an example. Gravity is a natural law. What does it say? Gravity says, well, if you're heavier than air, that you're going to be drawn to the earth. And so it doesn't matter whether you believe in it or not. You can say, I don't believe that. I, that's ridiculous. And you can get on a three-story building and jump off and say, whoo, I don't believe in the law of gravity. And what's going to happen to you? Splat. Right? Yeah. Because it's a law. The law is if you're heavier than air, you're going down when you, and so Paul says there are spiritual laws, and those spiritual laws are not going to change no matter how much we want them to. And Paul says, I find in a law that evil is present within me. Everybody say, the flesh is incorrigible. <laughs> yeah, in other words, the flesh cannot be changed. Not that, not that uh, we don't want to change it, not that we don't know we need to change it, but it's a law that it cannot change. So matter, no matter how committed or how determined we are, we're not going to be able to change the law of sin in our life, that God does not expect us not to sin, that actually God knows we can't stop sinning. That's why Jesus came, you know. Honestly, if we could stop sinning, then we could have obeyed the law and there wouldn't have been any reason for Jesus to come. 
but because God says, you have a law, and that law is sin and death, and in your flesh, it's going to always be active, and you're never going to be able to defeat the law of sin, so I'm going to have to send you a Savior that's going to be able to overcome that and give you life in spite of the fact that you can't overcome the sin nature. And that's all the Apostle Paul is saying here, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. In other words, with all of my heart, I want to please God. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. The law of my mind is I want to serve God. I want to trust God. I want to believe God. I want to do right things. I want to live a grace-filled life. So that's the law of my mind. That's what I want to do. I want to serve God in my heart. I believe it and I want to do it bad desperately for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. So every time my mind rises up and says, I want to do right, I have another law inside of me that drags me down and wars against the law of my mind, and it is so powerful that it just drags me, and it's the law of my flesh, and it just wars in my members. Oh, wretched man, look at that, verse 24. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So I can completely relate to this. I, I, I don't know about you, but I can completely relate to this because I love Jesus, but evidently not all of me loves Jesus, right? I love the Word of God, but evidently not all of me loves the Word of God. I want to do the right thing. In, in my heart, I, I, I want to do the right thing, but obviously not all of me wants to do the right thing because I have flesh and my flesh is fallen. And if I'm going to change, I have to wake up to the reality that part of me will not change. And every time I want to do the right thing, that fallen flesh is going to be there to sabotage me every time. And so in all of us, that flesh is there until Jesus comes or we go home. So understand this, if, if we're going to change, we have to understand that there is part of us that is never going to change. God doesn't expect it to change. God knows it can't change. It's fallen flesh. It is always going to sabotage me and war against the goodness of my life and the greatness that God would want to do in my life. So understand, first of all, the incorrigible nature, the corrupt, incorrigible nature of, of my flesh life that is in me. Secondly, here's the second understanding. Understand the purpose of the Holy Spirit in your life. When you come to the Lord, God says to you, I'm going to put part of myself on the inside of you. And that part of me that goes into the inside of you is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to take up residence in your life. At the end of chapter 7, the Apostle Paul said, Oh, wretched man that I am. And then he asked the question, Who is going to deliver me from this body of death? The last verse, and I just kind of skipped past it, is verse 25. And it, it kind of gives us a little preview of what the answer to that question is. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? I've tried as hard as I can. I've disciplined myself as much as anybody could ever discipline themselves. I've committed as much as anybody could commit, and I still can't control myself, is what the Apostle Paul is saying. I do what I said I would never do. I don't do what I said I was going to do. I make commitments, but then I break those commitments as soon as it makes it. I can't do anything about it. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? 
And then he says in verse 25, the last verse of chapter 7, uh, thank, thank God for Jesus Christ. It kind of gives us a little preview of what his answer is. How many of you know that in, in its original form, the book of Romans, that really any of the books of the Bible, were, were not written with chapters and verses. You know, in other words, the original manuscripts, does, it doesn't have Romans divided into chapter 7, chapter 8, verse 1, 2, 3. That those divisions were put there by translators so that we could have, uh, collectively study the word together and read it out loud and everybody could look at the same place and be at the same. I mean, it was the numbers of chapters and so forth were put there as aids to help us in our understanding and structure of the, of the scripture. But what, what it was originally is the book of Romans was what's called an epistle. Now, I know that some people think that an epistle is the wife of an apostle, but that's not true. <laughs> an epistle, an uh, epistle, <laughs> sorry about that, Lord. Uh, mm, forgive me. The flesh, there's the flesh. The, uh, but an epistle is a letter. That, that's all it is. So it's just like you write a letter, and when you write a letter, it's all, you know, just written all together. Well, chapter 7 and chapter 8 obviously, are an epistle. So really, uh, they're basically one train of thought that goes throughout chapter 7, chapter 8, in the flow of all of the scripture. And, and the apostle Paul is just saying, um, we can't change our flesh. It's incorrigible. It wars against us. So the first thing that we have to understand, look, the flesh is not going to change. It cannot be changed. There is a law, a spiritual law, and that law is fallen flesh will be a part of our life, and we're not going to be able to do anything to change that fallen flesh because it's incorrigible, and God is, you know, it, it is placed there. We're born that way. It is a result of the fall of man, and it will always be with us. And so if something is going to happen, we're going to have to understand what God has provided for us so that our lives can be changed. And so we have to understand the work of the Holy Spirit, the purpose of the Holy Spirit in our life. Now, Paul, in this might, you might uh, be interested in this. In chapter 8, all the way through chapter 8, the Apostle Paul t answers the question, who's going to save me from this body of death? And he talks about the Holy Spirit. And this, this is what he says. He, sa he says in the first 16 verses of chapter 8, he talks about the Holy Spirit 15 times in the first 16 verses. So obviously he's saying, I, I tell you what God has put in my life. He's placed the Holy Spirit on the inside of me. Let's just read some of it. Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh... God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity. Everybody say warfare. The carnal mind wars against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit that dwells in you. Now, I'm going to stop reading there at verse 11, but you, go, you could go on, and if you go on reading all of chapter 8, you'll find out that the Holy Spirit is talked about over and over and over and over as Paul's answer to the question about who's going to save him from the body of this death. Paul says, it's the grace of the Holy Spirit that's going to save me from the body of the dead. The power of the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to overcome the flesh 
and to do what God wants us to do. So we must understand the purpose of the Holy Spirit in our life. God never intended for us to live without the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. God did not create us without the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. And God did not intend for us to live this life without the power of the Holy Spirit being within us. Let me show you in Genesis chapter 2. Here's what the Bible says God did. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So here's what the Bible says happened when we were created. When man was created. God took the dust of the ground. And God formed and fashioned a a, a man in his own image, uh, in his own likeness. And then God bent over and God, uh, according to this verse, God God blew breath. Uh, The Greek word for that is emphusao, which we get our English word emphysema, which means breath of life. So God, when God created us, here's what he did. He, he, He took... He took our nostrils and he blew part of himself inside of us. God did not blow oxygen within our lungs. God blew part of himself on the inside of us. That Holy Spirit filled our life. So when God created us, God intended that we would live our entire life filled with the Spirit of God that God blew into us when we we were created. This is what what Jesus meant when he talked to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. You remember what Nicodemus, he was a Pharisee, and he came to Jesus and he said, I want to be saved, and how can I be saved? And Jesus said, you must be born again. Now, I know you've heard that term born again a lot. What does that mean? Well, Nicodemus asked the same question. He said, what do you mean I need to go inside my mother's body and be born again? Is that what you're talking about? And Jesus said, no, 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 no. What I'm talking about is you were born naturally on this earth, and that which is flesh is flesh, and that which is spirit is spirit. And he says, you you were born naturally on this earth and you were born without the spirit of God inside you because when Adam sinned, Adam lost the spirit of God that was on the inside of him. And now you are born and everybody that is born after that without the spirit of God, you're born wrong. You're born without God's spirit. And that which would be right with God must be born again, this time, of the Spirit, so that you will now live with the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. And so you must be born again. And that's what he was actually talking about when he was talking to them about about our life. Remember, we can't change our flesh. It's incorrigible. It's fallen. There's always a war going on inside of us. So the first thing we must understand is that God gave us an opportunity to overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit that he never intended for us to live without. There's only one other time that God breathing on us is mentioned in the entire scripture. And it's here in John 20 when Jesus is encountering his guys to be loosed into the world. Look what it says. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When, they, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then his disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So here is Jesus when he begins the earthly ministry of those who would create the church and everything that would represent the kingdom of God, he said, peace be to you. And here's what you need. And he went, just like God went into us when he created us. Jesus went into his disciples when he commissioned them to go forth. And he said, receive the breath of God. Receive the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. And so God, in Fusao, God breathed the breath of life back into us again. 
So God didn't breathe oxygen into Adam as the breath of life. He breathed his spirit into Adam, and he breathed his spirit, the Holy Spirit, into the apostles. Well, if God never intended for us to live without the Holy Spirit filling our life, what happened? Well, here's what happened according to a few verses later in Genesis 2. You know, God creates us, and then here's what he says in verse 16 to us. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So God is saying, look, don't eat of that tree, and if you do, the moment you partake of that tree, you're going to start dying on the inside. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the moment you start eating of that tree, d- does it mean physical death? Well, it, obviously it doesn't. You know why? Because Adam lived 930 years. The Bible in Genesis 5 tells you exactly how old Adam was when he died, 930 years old. So not, it doesn't mean that he's going he's to physically die as soon as he eats of the, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It means that the moment you eat of it, the Spirit of God is going to part from you and you're going to die spiritually in life. So what I'm saying to you is that God fills our life with the Holy Spirit because God did not create us. We are not designed to live without the power of the Holy Spirit being inside of our life. God never intended for his creation, man, to live at all without the Holy Spirit filling their life. And certainly he doesn't intend for us to live our entire life without the power of the Holy Spirit. So when we come to him and we are born again and we surrender to him and we say, Lord Jesus, come take control of my life, what God does is spiritually, he looks at us and he... And he breathes on us and we receive the Holy Spirit. And now there is part of God put back into our life. And so it's really not complicated any longer about how we live our life because there are only two options. There are not three or four different ways we can live our life. According to the Bible, we only have two choices. Look at what Paul said again in Galatians chapter 5. And here are our choices. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. What law? The law of sin and death. If you're led by the Spirit, it now somehow separates you from that law of sin and death that dominates your flesh life. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. If you, if you do not have the Spirit of God living on the inside of you if, you, if you have not been born again, if you have not come to Christ, here are the things that are going to dominate your life. Now, I'm sure it doesn't mean that every single one of these are going to be a part of your life, but, but these are the things that dominate the life of the people who do not have the Spirit of, Holy Spirit of God living on the inside of them. Look at what he says. Adultery, that's a sexual sin, right? Here's another one. Fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, all those are sexual sins. Then he says idolatry, which now is a spiritual sin, right? So idolatry and sorcery, well, those are spiritual sins. Look at the next little collection of of, uh, sins. They're all emotional sins. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies is another spiritual sin. Back to emotional sins, envy, murders, then sins of excess, drunkenness and revelries and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So one of the ways we have that we can choose to live is we can choose to walk after the flesh. And if we choose to walk after the flesh, this is the kind of life that we're going to produce. This is what the flesh seeks after. This is the way the flesh goes in life. Look at the very next verse, though. But the fruit of the Spirit... So if you choose to live by the Spirit... 
This is what the Spirit is going to bring on the inside of you. Look at what he said. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. So it's really not complicated how, how we live our life. There are only two choices. We can uh, uh, live according to the flesh or we can live according to the Spirit. So... I must understand the incorrigible nature of my flesh, that it's not going to change. Secondly, I'm going to understand the purpose of the Holy Spirit in my life, and the purpose of the Holy Spirit in my life is to fill my life with something that can battle against the law of the flesh, something that is greater than the law of the flesh, and it is the law of the Spirit of life. So the third understanding that we must have is understand the power of higher law. Now, this is really important, guys, but I want you to understand, and it sounds kind of technical, but it's really very simple. The only way to overcome a lesser law is to apply a higher law. Let me say that again, and it's not because I think it's smart, but I want you to get it, really. The only way to overcome a lesser law is by the, is by the application of a higher law. Let me show you what I mean in natural terms. In natural terms, the law of gravity is a lesser law. I mean, it is a, a base law. It, it, it's just it's right there. It's kind of like a first level law, and that is, if you're heavier than air, you you know you don't go up, you go down, you're pulled down. All right, that's the law of gravity. Well, can the law of gravity be overcome? Certainly, by applying a higher law, like the law of propulsion. The law of propulsion basically says that I can, I can propulse, I can push myself above the law of gravity if I use some type of resource that will push against gravity. However, if that resource stops, what's going to happen? Gravity's going to take over again and, you know, boom. But I can overcome the law of gravity. I have an opportunity to do that by applying a higher law. Well, in the spirit realm... What the Bible teaches us is that the way we overcome a lesser law is by applying a higher law. And what is the lesser law that we're trying to, come up, to overcome? It's the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is the law of our flesh. That's the base law of our life that we fight against. That's why you can't do the things that you want to do. That's why you can't overcome the things that you would love to change in your life. That's why you're sabotaged. Every time you want to do good, it wars against you and it fights against you and it sabotages you because all it is controlled by are those things that were listed in Galatians 5. Those are the things it strives for and the things it wants to do and it wants to be contrary to the Spirit in every opportunity opportunity. So in order to overcome this lesser law, the law of sin and death, there has to be a higher law. And according to uh, Romans 8, you remember we read it, there's therefore now con no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Here, here it is. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So God is saying to us, we are made free from the lesser law of sin and death by a higher law, which is the law of life through the spirit of Jesus Christ. And that's how we will overcome the law of sin and death, not by willpower, not by, not by, uh, not by uh, discipline in ourselves. But that's not going to do it for us. We're going to have to apply a greater law. And so we must understand that the way we defeat this lesser law is to have a higher law. And remember that there are only two choices in life. You're either going to walk by the power of your flesh or you're going to walk by the power of your spirit. Now, let's talk about willpower for just a second. I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that we don't need to practice self-discipline. I'm, I'm not saying that we don't need to, to do everything to control our life. I mean, this is important part of life, and it's important that we do this. And, and I'm certainly not speaking evil of trying to control yourself and, and all of those kind of efforts of life. But we know statistically that we cannot overcome the big areas of our life by willpower and self-control. We've already proven that to ourselves many times over and over, right? 
You know what willpower is? Willpower is like a rubber band. Have you ever wound a rubber band? You know, you know what I'm talking about? You've gotten a rubber band, you put him in it, and you start winding that rubber band? Well, that's like willpower. What, when it, what happens when you wind this rubber band? Well, it gets tighter and tighter, right? And it gets tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter until finally it comes to the point what happens to it. It, 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 it snaps, right? All right, so l- let's put this into life. You, you say to yourself, all right, uh, I'm going to get in shape. Uh, I, 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 I'm out of shape, and I need to get in shape, and I want to get in shape. And so you commit to yourself to get in shape in life. And so you wake up every day saying, I'm going to get in shape, and you start going after it. And, and, and by your very willpower, you know, you, you day by day, you work at it and you try to eat right and you're getting in shape and you're getting in fit, you're getting fit. And then one morning they find you dead in the back of a donut shop <laughs> because last night you snapped, boom. And now you've, you, you've overdosed on sugar because uh, you can't. You, you, once you get wound to a certain uh, uh, level, uh, it's going to snap in life. And so we can't overcome these big areas of our life by trying willpower because willpower only goes so far and then it snaps. And so actually, willpower, trying to overcome things with willpower, could be dangerous somewhat in our life because it leads us to snap sometimes in life. But the Apostle Paul says, and look at that first verse. This is an interesting thing. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So what is condemnation? I know a lot of times when you read that verse, you think of condemnation as something somebody says about you to condemn you, you know, that they don't talk bad about you. And so you read that verse and you say, you know what God is talking about? He's talking about nobody's going to talk bad about you once you come to Christ. But that's not what condemnation means. What the word condemnation means is literally the prison cell after the verdict. And let me just talk about that just a second. All right. When when, when, When you commit a crime and you go into court, the court listens to the evidence and then pronounces a verdict. And the verdict would be you're guilty. After you're declared guilty by the verdict, then the judge has to decide what is your punishment. And then he says, all right, your punishment for your guilty verdict is that you're going to have to spend 25 years in prison. And then when they actually take you and put you in the prison cell and slam the door, that is your condemnation. Your prison cell after the verdict is your condemnation in life. So what is this verse saying? This verse is saying that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, does that mean that we don't sin anymore? Certainly not. Does it mean that we're not guilty anymore? Certainly not. Does it mean not, we're not found guilty anymore? Certainly it does not. We're guilty. We're found guilty. But, but when the judge gives us the sentence, well, for your sin, for your life of sin, your verdict, your, your condemnation is you're going to go to hell for the rest of your life. And then the process where we, he do, where we have to go, that, that condemnation is stopped. And why is it stopped? Well, according to the verse, it's stopped because Jesus Christ came and took our place and therefore, we don't, have to serve, we don't have to serve the time after we've been found guilty in life. And so the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of Jesus Christ makes us free from the law of sin and death. And, and, and the devil wants to keep the focus on us. Like, you know, why, why are you the way you are? Why do you always do that? What's wrong with you? You don't read your Bible. You don't pray. You don't go to church like you should. You're always doing things that you say you're going to stop, but you never do. Notice that everything is about you, 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 you. And the problem is the devil is right about that. We do have something wrong with us. We do have a problem on the inside of us. And that problem is that we have, a, we have a, a flesh that is battling against us in every area of our life because the truth is that God does not expect me to stop sinning because I can't. 
Wouldn't it be unfair of God to expect something from me that I could not quit doing in my flesh of life? And I've already proven that I can't stop doing it because every time I want to do good, I don't do good. And every time I don't want to do bad, I'm pulled to do bad. I prove that to myself every day. And so because God knows that about me, God doesn't condemn my life. God gave me a Savior that took my place and overcomes that in life, and that comes through Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying in Romans 7, I can't stop. I've tried to stop. I've tried to overcome it with everything I have in life, and I can't stop. I can't be a good person. Because goodness is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. What is the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. How do these things come into my life? By willpower, by commitment, by desire to change? No, no, no. They're brought into my life by the Holy Spirit that comes to me whenever I surrender my life to Christ and, 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 and I give him control of my life. So the, the devil wants to convince us, you better get your act together so you can get to God. But the truth is, I can't get my act together. That's my problem. I can't control these things in my life. I've tried and I can't do it until I come to God. That's how I can get my life under control. If I can just get to God, I don't get things under control so I can get to God. After I get to God, God gets things in control in my life. And God tells us like in Hebrews chapter four, and I know I bring this verse up all the time, but this is a pivotal verse, guys, in our life. In in Hebrews four, it says, Uh, Therefore, come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help before it's too late. So what 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 is the Bible telling us? The Bible is saying in the weaknesses of your life, in the things that need to change in your life, what you must do is you must come to the throne of grace and lay this before the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help. What is the grace to help? The fruit of the Holy Spirit that is birthed on the inside you is God's grace to help you overcome the law of sin and death. It is the greater law, the, great, the spirit of life in Christ that is the only thing that can overcome the law of sin and death. And so here's what God's saying. On my worst day, at my worst times, when I say, oh God, most miserably, God invites me to his throne because it's not about me, it's all about Jesus. And he says, bring your nasty self to the throne of God and bow before me and ask me and I will, I will help you overcome the law of the sin and flesh by the law of the spirit of life. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you and it is the only thing that is powerful enough to overcome the law of sin and death. And, and, and I will birth these things inside of you if you will just come and lay it before me and ask me. This is, this is what I want to do in your life. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. So when the Holy Spirit comes into our life, that's what he does. Let's talk about two of those fruit for just a moment, and I'm finished, really. Let's talk about two of the fruit, goodness and self-control. All right. You say in your life, you wake up today, and here's what you say. I want to do the right thing. I want to live right today. Well, you know what goodness is, right? Goodness is God putting his desires within you. So goodness is God putting inside of you the ability to do right. That's what goodness is. So you wake up this morning and you say, I want to do right. But I don't know if you're aware of this or not. You have a little switch on the inside of you. You can almost feel it right up in here, yeah. I'm going to call it your, your, your Warner switch. Bill knows all about this Warner switch. He talks about it all the time. <laughs> but it's true. This is true. We have inside of us a, a, a little Warner switch. 
And when you want to do wrong things, it's because the wanter switch is switched in the wrong direction. Now, let me ask you this question, and this is, this is pivotal. Do you want to live the rest of your life trying not to do something that you really want to do? Trying not to do something that you really want to do. Is that how you want to live life? To me, that is torturous. I'm torturing myself. Right, as an example, do I want to live the rest of my life trying to stop doing something that I really do want to do? Now, I'm, I mean, just, just hang with me, all right? Like, I, I go to pour myself a cup of coffee in the morning, and there's a cookie jar right beside the coffee pot, and inside those cookies are looking at me when I go get my coffee. When I go get, and I, I, don't want, I, I don't want to eat the cookies because that's against my diet and it makes me fat and I've decided I don't want to be fat and I'm disciplined myself and I'm working out and I'm doing all kinds of things so I can't. Uh, so my willpower says, do not eat that cookie. And so as I get to pot, I, I look and the cookies with their little beady cookie eyes are looking out at me <laughs> and they're saying, you know you want me. And I say, yes, I know, but I can't have you. And so all day long, my, uh, the cookie gets in my head is what happened. It get, and, and all day long, I'm thinking about don't eat the cookie, don't eat the cookie. And I avoid the kitchen because I know in the kitchen, I'm going to pass that, that jar of cookies and whoo, it's going to be bad. So I avoid the kitchen uh, all day long because I said, I'm, I'm not going to eat one of those cookies. And then when I go to bed at night, I'm thinking, man, I, I, I don't eat, need to eat the cookies. Don't get up and get out of bed and get one of those cookies. And so this cookie has ruined my whole day. You should have eaten the cookie, yeah. <laughs> it's ruined the whole day because you've been thinking about that cookie all day long. You've been wanting that cookie all day long, trying your best not to eat that cookie all day long. So is that the way you want to live life, battling your flesh all day long? Attempting to overpower the flesh by your willpower and your commitment and your fortitude. That's a torturous way to live. What, what, the, what the word is saying here is, you, here's what happens. What is goodness? Well, goodness is, is the Holy Spirit giving me right desires. In other words, the, the goodness, the fruit of the Spirit, which is goodness, the Holy Spirit plants in my life as a fruit of God himself. And as goodness develops in my life, it creates the desire within me not to want what is bad, but to want what is good. So what goodness does on the inside of me is that wanter switch in there that is switched in the wrong direction that wants to do wrong and bad. The Holy Spirit flips that that want or switch in the right direction. And so you don't have to battle with the flesh all day long. You can walk in the spirit because God gives you goodness, which means God gives you his desires on the inside of you. So the war inside of you now is not a, a war of willpower against that which is bad because God has changed my wanter. In other words, I don't want that cookie anymore. I don't have a desire for that cookie anymore. I'm not fighting a battle all day long with my flesh saying, you want the cookie. You stay away from the cookie. Don't eat the cookie. But now the cookie's all up in here and the cookie tortures my life because I, I can't quit thinking about wanting that cookie. The Holy Spirit says, give it to me and I'll create goodness in your life and that goodness will change your desires. So when you look at the cookie, you won't even desire the cookie. The cookie's not even a, an issue for you in life. So you have a wanter switch in your life. Let's look at self-control. Self-control is the canter switch in your life. Uh, how many of you know you have a canter switch also? The canter switch decides what you can do and what you can't do, right? So your wanter switch says, I want you to do right, but you have a weak canter switch. Self-control. So what do you do with your canter switch that's weak? Well, you take the canter switch to the throne of God and say, Lord, give me self-control in my life. And God changes 
your canter switch to a can switch. Yeah, that's exactly right. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying that the Bible teaches us how to change our life is just like this. And seriously, is that when we wake up in the morning, maybe even before we get out of bed, but I just leave up to you how you practice it. What you do is you go to the, you go to the throne of grace and here's what you say. You say, Father, give me right desires today. Empower your Holy Spirit fruit inside my life so that today I don't have to battle my flesh all day long. That you just give your power in my life so that I will desire that which is good. And Lord, give, give me a stronger uh, a canter switch so that the self-control of life can be there to take me through life today. I'm laying this before you, Lord. I'm asking you to do this in life because I can't do this. Only your Holy Spirit can do this. Only you can overcome this in my life. So, Father, I, I, I lay it before you and I trust you and I say, take the warner, take the canter, give me goodness, give me self-control in life because I lay my life before you in Jesus' name. Now, that's what the Bible teaches us to do in order for our life to change. And here's the, the point. We're all in the same boat. If the Apostle Paul, who is one of the most theologically gifted people that's ever lived on this earth, and one of the most self-disciplined people that ever lived on this earth, if he had this much trouble with the flesh, how do we think we're going to escape that trouble with the flesh? So we don't overcome it by willpower and commitment. Now, we self-disciplined. I'm, I'm not speaking evil of that. But we're not going to overcome our flesh with that. The only way we're going to overcome our flesh is with a greater law of the spirit of life. And that comes through the fruit of the Holy Spirit that God births on the inside of us when we trust him and when we're born again by the spirit and not just by the flesh. So we all come to the Lord this way. So we wake up and we ask him every day. And we, when we ask him every day, he says, you come to the throne of grace. I'm going to give you mercy and you'll find grace to help when it's time of need. And that's what God says. Could it really be that simple? And can it really be that, 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 that lack of complication in life that we would just lay it? It is. It is. That's what the scripture teaches. So I tell you what let's do. Let's just stand to our feet right now. Let's